I'm back. Um, so, as I was saying, I've worked across a bunch of cities all over the world at different scales. But my background originally, originally, originally was computer science. Actually, I did a I did a bachelor's in that. So I studied AI back in um, 1988 to 1992. <laughs> just to, just to say that um, we were learning it then, and uh, um, but it wasn't really used much and. 40 years later, I guess now AI is, you know, running things like Spotify and so on. So things have progressed, but um, these things take a long time to kind of get out there in public and become mature, as you all know. So it's kind of interesting to do this talk, having had that long history with it. I then did a master's in urban sociology, but then spent most of my time in my career, in the first half working as an interaction designer and service designer. So designing digital services and things like that. Ultimately, that became much more to do with buildings and cities and spaces. And I started working with architecture firms and engineering firms and consultancies. I worked on the Google campus in California on the top left there, the new B&A building in London. Lots of work with museums and cultural institutions because they're super interesting in terms of urbanism, but also technology and public space and so on. Big city projects like the one in the top right in Sydney, one in the bottom left in Amsterdam. Um, and then looking at sort of strategic ideas for how tech changes cities and how cities change tech and uh, what tech does in the context of um, multifaceted places, complex cultural spaces and so on. And the one in the bottom right I'll talk about in a little bit, but it was um, a cell phone that I worked on a few years ago, actually, just like three years ago, by the Swiss company Punkt. And it's a cell phone, not a smartphone. It's got no real data in there. It's just a phone that just calls and texts. And that was done. Um, in the context of um, these devices kind of taking our attention while we're in uh, places and streets and environments. So it was looking at how can we prevent that or um, enable some of the modes of interaction in some way. So my background is interactions and user experience and dealing with people and places on the ground, but understanding that technology in the broadest sense changes cities, whether it's cars or elevators or the flushing toilet mechanism or AI, you know, they all of them uh, radically transform cities in different ways. And so with that in mind, there's a long history within some architecture and urban thinking at least of, you know, stepping back and carefully assessing tech because it's so powerful. And I really like this quote from Cedric Price from a, even longer ago before I was born, um, certainly before all you lot were born, <laughs> technology is the answer, but what was the question? And he said that uh, really when the car was beginning to kind of tear cities apart and people were very quickly, as you know, tearing up cities all over the world in favor of the big tech of its time, which was the automobile and the very 20th century thing, the car. And um, right in the middle of the 20th century, this was what was happening. But Cedric was asking, you know, we really need to think, well, what is moving around about? What is this a city like London or Bogota about or Paris about? And then we can talk about the technology. But that wasn't being asked at the time. It was really tech first and then the, the thinking about community afterwards, actually, for various reasons we can talk about later. But I really, I really like this philosophy of him sort of knowingly and ironically recognizing that we jump on tech as some kind of solution, the kind of solutionism that you might have been thinking and talking about without really stepping back and asking what a place is about in the first place. So with this in mind, you know, there's lots of tech rolling around cities now and tech and or trends or patterns or whatever you want, themes, whatever, how you want to describe them. And they're all changing, of course, what's possible. So um, the one in the middle at the top there, I'll talk about this briefly, these um, renewable energy grids. There's the picture there is a place in Australia, in Perth. Um, it's a prototype project or a real one with people living in it. It's a really nice up unit apartment blocks four people in each of those, or two people, I think, actually. And there's a bunch of them behind. They have solar cells on the roof, battery in the basement. So it's effectively kind of an off-the-grid pattern, but it's in the middle of a city. So it's in the middle of Perth. So it's kind of an interesting uh, question mark. We haven't really done off-grid in the middle of cities, and at least for a long time. We've usually done them in the countryside or by the beach or something, but in the forest. But this is right there. So what does that mean? Does that mean that they contribute their energy back to the city if they have excess of it? Does it just totally self-contained? Does a self-sufficient microgrid? Do they pay taxes if they are self-sufficient? Interesting question. I would argue that they should do for various numerous reasons, uh, systemic and civic, but 
I guess the question is immediately out there as soon as it starts gathering its own water, say, or using its own shared mobility. And then equally, that changes the dynamic around energy from being, um, let's say, just kind of plumbing or engineering or invisible infrastructure. Remember, the word infrastructure sort of means below or beneath the structures, as in hidden and invisible, but making them work. Whereas actually, this is the energy is on the roof and it's in the basement. Um, it's highly visible. You know, it's coming from your roof. So if I'm in one apartment and Hubert is in the next apartment and uh, we're good friends, then it's fine. You know, we share the energy together. But say... Um, you know, I want to watch the Champions League tonight on on TV and Hubert has used all the energy making some nice pasta, then what do I do? Do I knock on his door and say, what happened to the kilowatts? You know, it's like, it's, it's immediately a social question and a cultural question. If you designed this cleverly and uh, with collaboration with people and place, then there's a way of making a very harmonious situation. Potentially, you could reinforce social fabric in this way by highlighting these kind of seams, making what we call seam full systems instead of seamless systems. But if we don't do that, then we end up with some sort of JG Ballard style nightmare with Uber and I like, you know, falling out of a, a few kilowatts. And that, that could happen all too easily, as you can imagine, if it's designed, let's say, but if I stereotype it by a particular kind of engineering or plumbing mentality. So we, we haven't had to think about that for a while because the energy just comes from the plug in the wall and it comes from somewhere else. You know, we don't often haven't thought about it like that, but here then it's super local. There is AI happening in those buildings. There is actually in this specific one, there are effectively blockchain based ledger systems tracking energy use across the blocks there, probably using more energy than they're saving from the roof. Um, but uh, this is then a different thing. It's a social context all of a sudden. So this is why we, we like this kind of work. It's, it's putting the tech in the context of something which is actually ecological and human at the same time. It means it's no longer just electrons moving around. It's not just lines of code. All of the things on this page have that kind of different dynamic. And that means that we have to change the way we think about them. And so the last three years, I've been working in the government and the innovation agency in Sweden. And we've been really wrestling with this quote from Albright here that um, that 21st century system I just described, if you approach that in the 20th century concept and you respond with 19th century tools, let's say like the old regulation approach that we used to have um, around these things or the old participation structures or the old governance structures, it's absolutely not going to work. Um, and there are numerous reasons why, but I, I, I very much like Timothy Morton's work about all of this stuff. Uh, he talks about hyper objects and um, a very acute understanding of the way these systems work in this massively interconnected way, which immediately breaks all previous governance models, <laughs> except some um, very deep-seated indigenous uh, governance models, which I'll get to at the end. But the, this, what he points out about air conditioning, also applies to almost every other tech we might want to think about. Um, you know, we think air conditioning makes the air cooler in the room that you're in. And actually, of course, it's just moving the hot air out, outside into the street. So it's not actually cooling the air on the planet at all. In fact, it's using energy to do so. So it's actually making everything hotter. <laughs> um, so it's just shifting a few, again, atoms from one state to another, but it's not actually changing the situation. We pretend it is. And we pretend there's a barrier between the inside of my room and the outside in the street there. And there's maybe even a different governance model. There's different political structures around those artificial boundaries, but they are completely artificial boundaries. And uh, they just don't work. Now we understand everything is connected. So we need to really rethink what we're doing here. And so this is a diagram I constantly keep coming back to and revising. It's always in progress. But what I'm trying to understand is how we start thinking of these systems at multiple scales simultaneously, multiple kinds of interactions and the kind of skills and this is a very design-led diagram because um, I'm a designer. I should have said that I run a design school, but I'm trying to think, you know, how do we recognize all of these things are actually connected? And how does software interact then with industrial design and architecture and urban planning, strategic design and so on at these different scales all at the same time? So what that comes to, and let's see if this um, video rolls well enough, but we, we often in my teams, when I've been working more in teams, we start sketching. And we sketch in video often. This is a little video looking at an autonomous shuttle pickup um, interaction. So this is Anna using her watch to call an autonomous vehicle. Uh, it's going to head somewhere in the street. She goes out into the street. We realized in doing this, long story short, 
spoiler alert, but uh, bus stops are a good idea, <laughs> actually, and physical bus stops as well. So we think we could, through Uberpool and things like that, you can just coordinate things on phones, but I don't think you get the glanceability that um, my team is exhibiting here. Sorry for the bad acting, by the way, but just, uh, you know, the designers, not actors. But um, this way you get three people into one autonomous shuttle as, instead of just Anna there on the left, because they can see, they can glance across and see that bus is arriving and going roughly where they're going. And they might just then wait. But then there's tons of questions embedded in this. And by the way, we made this video just in house. So that that's my old watch. <laughs> Um, this is a wall in the office. You know, these are really nice ways of quickly sketching this out. It took like two or three days to make the film, you know, from blank piece of paper to doing this. And it only lasts, as you can see, like 30 seconds. But in that, there are all these questions embedded and you can use this design practice to kind of pull out the questions here. You know, will, will Anna get in? Will she want to kind of share a vehicle if it costs less money or not? Uh, will she want to get in a small vehicle with complete strangers? You know, uh, people get into buses and tube trains, metro systems at a certain scale with strangers all the time. It's actually, they get into Uber sometimes with strangers all the time, but only in certain cultures and contexts. You know, does, does this happen in the same way as in Tokyo as in Toronto? You know, who knows? So we have to test this stuff out. It's deeply cultural and highly embedded. Um, and then you can kind of go up and down that scale. And what's the interplay with public transport and so on? But you also ask the question, so if you have these autonomous shuttles moving around, so AI driving these buses, trundling around, taking people backwards and forwards, what kind of load can they take? What jobs does that do? How does it interact with other things, whether there's buses or foxes? You know, those are all good questions. Um, what does the street feel like if you have this constantly flowing pattern of vehicles moving in all directions? We started thinking, well, actually, that's kind of the way streets used to work. This is Sydney in 1906. And you see it's moving in all directions simultaneously. There's no stop start here because there's no traffic lights. Actually, traffic lights would make this worse. So everything is kind of constantly flowing. And I like drawing back from history when I'm also thinking about these things as well. You know, it's, we've seen a lot of these patterns before. And you see here, there's some very lovely fluid movement across the street there. The, the sidewalk is kind of a sketch rather than a rule. Um, there's a constant flow of trams, there's horses, of course, there's all kinds of stuff. I don't want to over romanticize this because, you know, this was a terrible city at the same time. Uh, running back two years earlier, we did something previously around bikes and looking at augmented reality bike helmets, in this case, for wayfinding for cyclists. The cyclists move in different ways to cars and pedestrians. You know, they, they can go on the road. This is London, so it's messy and there's no bike lanes, it's super dangerous. <laughs> Um, but they can also move like a pedestrian. So Anna, in this case, wants to go through there, through that little thing that's lighting up. So we said, okay, you want to head through there. How do we give that direction to her in real time? Now, I'm not suggesting that the bike helmet here is a good idea, by the way. We make these videos to flush out bad ideas and good ideas. Maybe it's interesting that this is one interface we looked at, but it's probably a very expensive, not very resilient bike helmet to do that. Um, but we did a bunch of other stuff here as well. So, you know, when you're kind of, um, when you start thinking about the overlay, you can start thinking about the way that people read the city differently. So, uh, and the thing that tech can do versus the thing that humans can do. That's why I call this minimum viable magic. So what if Anna's cycling down here and she can see the shard as a wayfinding, the shard being a big skyscraper in London. And so you're using the, the landmarks here and picking them out for her so that when she turns the corner, she can see it and then navigate using the city. So she puts the tech away at that point, actually, which is interesting. Um, tech companies don't tend to have you put the tech away, right? But this one, once you've done that journey a couple of times, Anna no, remembers the shard. She doesn't need that data layer over the helmet. You know, that's not going to move. And she's moving. And she remembers how to read the city because that's been how we've read cities for millennia, actually, and landscape. Um, or then finally, this very little simple device here, just on the handlebars saying that the clean air right now is to the left. <laughs> and, um, you know, so it's a very subtle interaction. It doesn't distract the cyclist. It could be done with e-ink. It's super lightweight. But what that kind of asks is how does that, how does that happen? And, you know, we made him cycle past this little thing on the left there, indicating perhaps there's a, you know, 5G transmitter in the thing on the left that's connecting to something like the phone in his pocket, which then sends a simple signal, very simple signal to the thing on the handlebars. So the thing on the handlebars can have 
um, this thing needs no processing at all, really. It can be very light, almost throwaway. You know, it's a very almost like a disk with some e ink on it because all the processing is in the system and the network is in that box. The system's behind it if there's an air quality sensor in there. Um, and he's using the phone in his pocket. So it's, it's beginning to articulate how a network might work in order to enable the interaction to be as minimal as possible, but still be useful. Anyway, so, um, so this kind of thing about minimal interactions also led to my work, as I mentioned, with this uh, company Punct and the, this um, cell phone, not smartphone. So this actually runs on Android, but we shoved Android way down inside the phone and basically deleted half of it. <laughs> So all it really does is calls and texts, very simple interactions like that. And it is deliberately designed for you not to be distracted. So you can kind of pick up this phone. You're totally available to be to answer calls or you can call someone, right? But it does really nothing else on purpose. We're trying to get to the phone-ness of the phone, not the computer-ness of the phone that they've become. So it's certainly not for everybody. I can tell you it's very confronting using this phone. You realize how much we rely on, on your smartphone 100% of the time. But it's amazing when you do use the phone, if you're brave enough to do so, because you realize you get your attention back. It's really confronting. You're in the city and you're paying attention to them. I mean, you're not Instagramming stuff. I found I used my real camera more than my phone camera. I was reading books more than I was looking at the screen. You know, it, it just, it really actually changed the way I walked around the city, how I interacted with my kid. Um, so this is kind of interesting thinking again about these sort of minimal interactions. Again, it's not for I use a, I use an iPhone basically, of course, all the time, like most of the rest of us, I guess. But um, but it's an amazing to have this phone to switch into this mode when you want to. And how do we enable that kind of choice and then switch back to a smartphone when you need that? Um, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. So so these kinds of projects I've done a lot around using these um, data embedded in objects, basically Internet of Things. You can imagine the code underneath this stuff, but these are all your variations actually using e-ink as well as a particular display type because it's, it's actually really slow. And that slowness is lovely. Um, it uses no energy or very little energy unless you change it. It's very legible. It's like a little artwork. We designed this for um, an arts complex in Melbourne. This is before it opened. And so we're just kind of sketching out how people might interact with each other in different ways and how these communal displays could be accessed by everybody in the building and send messages to it. But equally, as you see, Becca leaves her room there. Her Slack status changes when she closes her door. So we're using the interface as the, of the door to trigger her Slack status because the open door Half open door is an interface we've understood for ever since we invented doors, right? Thousands of years ago. Um, but how do you get that to trigger Slack instead of her having to go into Slack and update her status herself? You know, how do you send a message to the building saying, you know, let's have a drink? So that kind of glanceability you saw there with Becca, and this is all fictional, of course, again, terrible acting by my design team, but. Anyway, you see, the, see what we're getting at there. There's code underneath these systems, there's interactions, but you can see this is predicated on something that is highly social. Once they're having the drink, the tech is just completely irrelevant. So how do you get it to fade away like that? Um, we've done also a lot of work on these kind of mixed reality cities around planning and citizen interactions. So very briefly, this one, these are all, a lot of these are online, by the way, and I can send links around after Rocky Bear probably has a lot of these links to hand. But um, this one is uh, looking at, you know, how do we engage around what's possible about urban spaces? How do we enable, uh, you know, multiple ideas to be visualized in situ? So not in a piece of paper stuck to a lamppost or back in the city hall, but actually something on the ground there. And then how could you get, you know, feedback from that? Again, this is all spoofed in After Effects, as you can tell, but it was kind of the sketching part. This one is, you know, the same thing, but on a model, because models are kind of amazing. People love models because they understand them and can move them around. So how do you use the AR layer, augmented reality layer, to look at the solar gain on this roof, if that unit is oriented like that, or if Anna turns it through 90 degrees, then the solar gain halves, the, or 30% less, so you might do something else. You might grow tomatoes on it or something. So that kind of interaction in place again. This is all for Ericsson, by the way. And then with Ericsson, uh, we did a little bit of further work with them, but Ericsson really took it with UN Habitat. They did this amazing work in South Africa, modeling the campus of Wits University in uh, Johannesburg in, um, with LiDAR scans. And then they converted that to Minecraft models, <laughs> working with Moyang. So this became then an interactive layer that could be used with students. And so then they put the phone 
in the AR mode again, they had kids working on uh, the Minecraft model in the room, and then they went out and put the Minecraft model in the world. And then, so this is the very early quick sketch of you know the Minecraft modifications that the students have made overlaid onto the reality behind them. Uh, and this is the very first prototype. It's really super sketchy, but it kind of works, right? So I'm not saying that's a great idea, by the way, just because you know you are architects. But um, what's interesting is how people love the sense that the city is malleable, that it belongs to them, and that they can make make a mark with it. In this case, you could use pen and paper for this as well, right? But um, Minecraft is a tool that a lot of people actually understand. And it's a very good modeling engine because it has properties, magical properties. So Ericsson then took that on and developed something a bit more plausible and done similar work. But you, you, I don't, you can't hear this audio here, but the reaction, you can probably tell. <laughs> so people are just delighted to see, again, the kind of their ideas in situ. And I so said, you can also do this with pen and paper, um, just, to, just to make the point, like, this is work that my team did, you know, redrawing the plan for Sheffield and putting it in the streets and then engaging people around it. So you can do this with augmented reality. Pen and paper is also a technology, also super useful. That was This one really worked as well. Then you've got to think about, well, you know, who does this? Should Ericsson own that? Or should Sheffield City Council own that? Or should the university own that? You know, these are all the political questions behind it. And they're absolutely part of the technology, of course, as you all know. So Bianca Wiley's work here is amazing. Shannon Madden, people like that. Um, I guess I, the work I've done in government has been very much about this as well. So what I did in Sweden recently was really looking at, well, how would we transform streets in this more holistic way? How do we start building a platform for enabling a kind of a retrofit of streets? Um, that would begin to enable us to bring all of these things together into real-time prototyping environments in the street. So how do you collide AI next to these kind of interactions, next to politics, next to greenery, next to culture, all at the same time? So again, long story short, but there's a book about this I can send you afterwards. Uh, we said, let's try and retrofit every street in Sweden. Why not? <laughs> That's one big system. They're all connected to each other. If you held all the streets in Sweden in your hand, you know, it'd be 40,000 kilometers of a street, but it's, it's one system cut into many pieces, but it's basically all the same thing. So we did lots of participation sessions again uh, with stakeholders, um, experts, people implicated in the way those streets happen from a technical point of view. We did lots of work on getting people out into the streets. So pulling people into the actual urban reality out of their office. Uh, all of this is written in this book, if you're wondering why that previous slide looked like a book, so you can download this as a free PDF. Um, send the link later, but it, all of this is about reframing this idea of what a street is about. So a street isn't about traffic, you know, we've let it become about traffic, but streets are for hundreds of years have been about many other things. So how do we open up all of the possible things one might do with a street? and then see the street as a prism to play those things out. You know, you can use the street to increase biodiversity, increase social interaction, reduce um, air pollution, you know, increase greenery, all of these things. So it's not really just about traffic flow. That's just one of the things and possibly one of the least important things. So what came out of those sessions with these kind of clues as to what we might do with streets, this is me kind of um, colliding all of the different drawings everybody did in those sessions. Then we found a bunch of streets working with Stockholm municipality that we could prototype with, uh, with schools on. So we let the school kids then become the lead designers of their own street, the street where their schools are. And we literally get, you know, put the pen in their hands. Now these sessions were facilitated by architects and other designers in Sweden. But we let them decide actually. And um, we've also done this with the prime minister of Sweden and the health minister, that's these people on the left there. I won't try and embarrass you to remind you to get to say their names, but um, the prime ministers also can get behind this kind of thing, but I have to say kids better at this than prime ministers are. Um, and not least because this is where the kids live and work. You know, this is their street, right? So the kind of ideas that the kids come up with are lovely and playful and exuberant and vibrant, as you might imagine, and green and convivial, all of the things that kids are naturally brilliant at this. So then we look at this platform, we made this in wood, in Swedish timber, because it's a circular material, but it's also super adaptable, so you can deploy it in a lightweight way and use it as a platform. So imagine this base layer, like a boardwalk, that you can build applications on top of, and those applications are defined by the kids. It could be bike parking or trees, right? 
We also have done the AR thing here as well, by the way. So Utopia Architect, we funded to um, work on a, an AR toolkit for this called Studs Labber, which is launching soon. But these are the things that came out of the other end. These are the real prototypes in the streets, you, following a kind of parklet model, so very tactical urbanism, but again, led by the national government, so strategic at the same time. And there are role as the government was to basically bring all of the um, partners around the street together, whether that's school kids or Volvo cars or um, you know, several municipalities or the National Transport Agency. They were all involved in the project. And it kind of looks and feels a bit like this. It's a really lovely thing to introduce this material into the street as well. But embedded in that are a lot of ideas. I won't go through them in detail without time, but um, I, I got the artist and musician Brian Eno to write some design principles for us. And I really love his one in the top left there. Think like a gardener, not an architect. Design beginnings, not endings. So get something going and make the beginning really good. Don't worry about the outcome, but then stay on board like a gardener has to keep engaging and keep tending it as it grows and learning from it, real feedback loops. And then in the bottom left, make places that are easy for people to change and adapt. So using wood as opposed to steel and concrete. Obviously transport departments love steel and concrete because they can put it out there and it stays the same for 50 years, no maintenance. That's exactly why it's the wrong thing to do because <laughs> cities change and streets change. And so you need it to kind of change with the speed of culture and wood can do that actually, interestingly. So this then becomes a kind of a platform for testing. And you'll see, you know, I scribbled on here, you know, machine learning driven curbside management systems. <laughs> That's something you guys are probably thinking about. There's something you can test here, right? You can build the sensors in. We've created the space for experimentation. This thing literally says, welcome to the experiment on it. Um, but you can also test health and well-being. And, you know, did you increase the bird song? Uh, did you increase social fabric? All on the same thing. And that's what we're looking at with this. Um, Volvo started using it in their promotional stuff for their car sharing program because they were one of our partners. So every car sharing car that goes in can replace up to eight or nine private cars in terms of utility. So it's an extraordinary kind of mode shift. Um, of course, you might think about using algorithms to organize where those cars are and things like that when they're available. But you see what it does to the street space, literally, and what you could then begin to unlock. So the technology of the car you can use to basically re-green the streets. So super interesting, using code and robots essentially in the in the long run, because these are probably autonomous at some point to actually enable a street which is full of butterflies and birds, if you get that right. Um, so the outcomes then are super broad and diverse as well. So we worked on something called the value model, which is you know, all of the different kinds of outcomes you might get from this. So you, again, Increase in bird species diversity is the kind of outcome we're shooting for here using the tech that I'm talking about there. Those are the kind of things we might get to. And that then I called this the one minute city and, and, and sort of building on Paris's 15 minute city, like the immediately intimate city, the one you have a direct relationship with outside your front door that you're implicated in. You know, you can talk to your neighbor and you can agree to grow tomatoes there yourselves, right? And you can, you know, it's then your job to look after them, you're, they're your tomato. So it's a very different dynamic to a 15 minute, which I also love, by the way, but that's much more a kind of, uh, so that's a big scale, 15 minutes on a bike. It's a big district, right? So it has to, it's more about organizing services at that level. It's, it's a little bit more top down, although it's participative too. Um, and this is in the spirit of, you know, amazing work like this. Ron Finley's work in Los Angeles turning. Park, vacant parking lots into urban farms where he's figured out you can grow 724 million tomato plants in vacant parking lots in LA and, in and food that, deserts. Oh yeah, no, you just, there. Go on. Just, to, just to let you know, like you have two minutes left. So, okay. Okay. Perfect. I will stop precisely in two minutes. Um, or this uh, adaptable modular meadow on the right there that the Melbourne-based artist Linda Tech did for Arctis again in a parking lot. So. These are green systems, but they're almost using modular loose kit of parts. What in the early days of the internet we call small pieces loosely joined. Uh, you know, the basic design principle of the internet also works very well in cities, also works well for meadows, it turns out. So these things are beginning to collide in interesting ways. So you know what, I'm gonna just pause there because um, I'm this close to the end. Actually, maybe I'll just, I'll try and race through it super quickly, okay? You bet, if that's okay. I'll just do it, I'll go very fast now. So what this means is a reframing of tech 
technology. I really like Julia Watson's work here. If you want to reference, she wrote this book called Low Tech, which is tech here is traditional ecosystem knowledge or traditional ecological knowledge, which is looking at how indigenous communities or nature-based communities have used technology. And in Australia, we have the longest continuous civilization on the planet, 60,000 years. Indigenous Australians have been managing uh, the land and cultivating it through custodianship with a very acute understanding of technology from the start, but not how we think about it, <laughs> not how we think about it in terms of GitHub and Facebook, but uh, using the land as a technology itself. And that's incredibly powerful, this example from East Kolkata wetlands. Again, I wrote about this, I can send a link. I won't go into it now, but it's far more powerful than, a, let's say, a more contemporary approach, like the Gates Foundation Omniprocessor, which is also a great thing, by the way. But if you look at what the Kolkata one does, and Kolkata is a technology, right? That wetlands has been shaped by humans over centuries in a particular way. And it's an extraordinary productive thing. So that means a reframing of what tech is, which we don't really know what that looks like, particularly in cities, actually. Tim Christopherson says, you know, we know what a four-lane highway looks like, but we don't know what a restored landscape of a million hectares looks like. Um, so this is where I'm really interested in films like um, Black Panther, actually, and Hannah Beekler's work there. Because uh, then, you know, in this street scene, you see no cars. There are no cars in Wakanda. Um, <laughs> It's super vibrant and diverse. It's very a bit, it's a bit like the 1906 film of Sydney I showed you, but it's also got a hyperloop in the background and a floating autonomous bus, you know? So it's like all of those things simultaneously, but it's clearly a super convivial street scene right? and highly localized and very specific. I think the artist Olala Kanjaifus does this amazing work based in Brooklyn. He does these beautiful visualizations of a reconfigured Brooklyn, which is, you know, half machine, half trees. Uh, and more besides, so my colleague Rory Hyde here at the University of Melbourne looking in a what maybe more literal way, in a more uh, practical way, <laughs> how are we going to retrofit the Australian suburbs using these kind of technologies? So I just say these dynamics you can begin to think about there, drawing from indigenous, drawing from code, drawing from patterns, drawing from meadows, all of this stuff has this kind of quality to it, participative, distributed, local, diverse, fast and slow at the same time, old and new at the same time. And that makes me think of uh, temples in Japan, like Ise, where they rebuild them every 25 years, completely from scratch. And they've done this for centuries and centuries. They use wood to do that practice. Constant process of renewal enables something to last forever. So actually destroying something and rebuilding in this very harmonious way enables this long-term practice. You see that in Japan all over. And another colleague of mine, Maddie Miller at the University of Melbourne, has written, and this is a great article, by the way, I recommend to you, The Future of Our Cities is Indigenous. And again, just think about Indigenous tech in this context. What, what, what might that mean for you guys? Um, and this work by Alison Page and Paul Mann, same sort of stuff. This is, this is big in Australia. I'd say big in Canada a bit, uh, but we still have you know, strong Indigenous communities um, beginning to rethink what that might mean for a new kind of practice. So this is my last slide. How do we reconcile this old and new stuff? I've showed you a bunch of old stuff and a bunch of new stuff. <laughs> um, how do we find space and time and opportunity for these kind of, as I put here, these more meaningful entanglements? How do we shift from this transactional idea of cities, very kind of customer-based idea around the smart city to something far more relational, far more Wakanda actually, far more indigenous um, would be interesting. And you know, from my point of view, what kind of design school makes all of that stuff happen. That's my own challenge. You don't, you don't have to worry about that. Just, yeah. Anyway, thank you. Sorry that went over you there, but hopefully we have time to talk still. No worries. Thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Dan, for this fascinating uh, presentation. It actually, it's, it's really great for the emerging leaders because uh, you talked about several topics that, uh, that we have to work on for the final projects, like urban and interfaces uh, without smartphones. Uh, low technologies, uh, so the concept which is the, the one minute city, actually, we will have debate about the 15 minute city. Uh, so really, thank you. Uh, thanks for this, uh, Dan. Well, um, as usual, if you have uh, questions that uh, you would like to ask, feel free to virtually uh, raise your hand. Okay, here we go. It's good. Uh, Ruth, I think you were in there by a nanosecond at the head of OMA. So. <laughs> Go for it. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much for this talk. And I just have to say as a comment, first of all, I really liked your videos. 
um, I thought they really brought us into um, into the ideas and 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 conveyed them really nicely. It felt very immersive. So that's just a comment. Very cool. Um, I just have a a kind of a question or like a tension maybe that I was sensing. Um, on the one hand, some of the examples you showed, the technology in a way engages people, you know, specifically that one in Johannesburg, it kind of engaged people to think about the city um, and imagine ideas, or um, I'm not exactly sure what they were doing, but in one, on, in the one hand, deeply engaged. But then on the other hand, just thinking about infrastructure and the way that infrastructure sometimes works and we don't understand it, like for example, um, you know, you were talking about the aircon and the fact that, you know, I, the aircon comes on and I just think, oh, it's magically cooled down my house, but actually, you know, it's going out, out, of, uh, out of the building and, and heating another space. And the same thing with yeah. these cars in the future, potentially, you know, a, a car just suddenly arrives, but I have no idea how it works uh, or functions. So on the one hand, yeah. you know, I think there's immense potential for technology to engage people and, and to get them thinking about cities. But then on the other hand, there's almost a separation and lack of critical thinking about how mm. these uh, systems of infrastructure kind of work. And I was exactly. just wondering um, what, you know, a little bit more about your thoughts on that. And, and, and uh, no, it's a fantastic, well, it's a great, it's a great question, Ruth, and a massive question, I would say. So let me, let me just, um, I won't try and answer it deeply perhaps. Um, but that 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 critique that you maybe picked up in my work is constant, and it's something that I meant by why I showed you the Cedric Price quote first. Actually, technology is the answer, but what was the question? And you know, just um, for instance, the shared cars, as we know with Uber and Lyft, they came in on the promise that we'll reduce congestion because we'll be sharing vehicles, so therefore we don't need as many vehicles. And in fact, they massively increased congestion by as much as fifty percent in cities like San Francisco, where there was already a congestion problem. Same with Airbnb, you know, it can increase rents in cities that already had a housing affordability problem. So, so it really, um, the tech requires massive critical um, thinking and careful attention to, it. I guess that's what I'm saying. Wait, so to, put, to make the point about the videos, actually, that's partly why we made the videos to kind of try to flush out, like, how is this going to work, actually? You know, where is it, where is it going to go? And as soon as you try and start drawing it or sketching it or make a video or rehearse it, you, all of these questions start coming to in a far more tangible, acute way. So um, all I would say to you is that technology is everywhere. And I just, you know, that's why I ended with this point about indigenous technologies, which go, which go back literally 50,000 years in the Australian case, in a continuous line. Um, and they can be wonderful and magical and life enhancing. Uh, but if you think about the way that an indigenous community or a nature-based approach to the tech, and don't think about the past, by the way, but the future, because it's, a, it's constantly evolving, that relationship, but it's highly relational. There is uh, not much understanding of waste in those cultures. And there's no sense that if I do something, like you said, with the air conditioning, that it's not gonna have an impact on you. That's understood that it will have an impact. And it's been baked into the way that the land and the country has been managed for, again, far more successfully than we've ever managed in a Western Northern model for 300 years, let's argue. <laughs> so, so I would love, uh, I guess I, I can't give you an answer except to say be super critical. Uh, technology is always there. We don't have a choice not to use it actually. So it's not, I, I can't like not have it. It's just the way that we do that then becomes important. And then to take this highly sensitive, relational, empathetic, um, approach to that. Uh, there's, there's a very critical agenda. Um, that is my, my my best hope for a practice. And then we can pick off tech and context one by one. But you know that that would be a broad brush stroke answer to your very good question. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. No, no worries, Omar. I think you're next. Yes, hi, uh, my name is Omar. I'm based in Montreal, and uh, I work in the domain of accessibility. Uh, so in particular, mm. I audit metro stations uh, and assess their accessibility. And uh, mm. thank you for the talk. This has been very fascinating. And I love your, your power with words because you describe them so uh, wonderfully. Um, what I'm very curious about is the term that you've used quite a lot in your examples called glanceability. And mm. uh, 
you know, very I, ocular centric, exactly. <laughs> very uh, privileging eyesight. I'm aware of that. Exactly, and you know, uh, when I when I heard that word glanceability, and then you showed it with some of the examples, I was curious about um, how do we connect that with diverse demographics across the city, right? If we are designing all these systems and thinking about user experience and user interface, um, how how can we make them more adaptable so that it fits or serves all the people that are in the city? Mm. Any thoughts on that? Um, yes, um, it goes back a little bit to the point, I guess, before. Um, I actually, I, I didn't put it in the talk, because it just as you could tell, I had too many slides anyway, but I did a project called Cities Unlocked with uh, Guide Dogs for the Blind, which is the main charity in the UK for visually impaired people. And um, Transport for London, so again, I can send a link around afterwards. But there we looked at how would tech be used, because it was also with Microsoft Research, um, to enable a kind of very advanced form of wayfinding for visually impaired people on the basis that you know, there's almost a, a million people in the UK that can never leave their home, actually, just because the city isn't designed with visually impaired people in mind. So. So again, in like, a bit like the answer to the previous question, if one goes into it with this participative, very engaged agenda, um, one ought to be able to find these multiple diverse use cases and start building those with those communities. Again, that's, that's a very glib thing to say. I know that's super hard, but that's, in my experience, that's the only way to start doing this. So to have, Guide Dogs for the Blind there, um, leading that work with us as designers and technologists was absolutely fundamental because no matter how much I wear these glasses, you know, I can still actually see. When I had to wear a blindfold and have a cane in my hand and try and walk around London, it was the most terrifying thing I've ever done. <laughs> um, and that project, you know, meant I had to do that actually. But then having them as co-designers, we came up with something quite interesting using sound in that case to navigate with numerous kind of ways around it. I won't go into detail. So to me, again, it comes back to participative, relational, empathetic. You can use technology. You, you have to, again. Um, but then really carefully work that through on the ground with people, not in the lab, but on the ground in the real city uh, and with the kind of yeah, user base, citizenry, whichever word you, you want um as the co-designers of the system and again easy to easy for me to say here late at night but that's 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 the way forward um thank you and no, but th thank you also for picking me up on the glanceability thing i'm uh, more conscious of that but it's um um the multi-sensory city is something that we don't pay enough attention to and the, the Finnish architect, Johanny Palasma, came up with this phrase, ocular centric, noting that architects tend to really privilege uh, vision and sight over all the other senses. Um, so how tech gets using that multi-century thing, is that's incredibly interesting to me anyway. Um, Gabor, next up, this is like a nice queue of people here. <laughs> hey, uh, I'm Gabor. Hey. I'm an IoT engineer in Taiwan, working on smart home. Uh, devices mm -hmm. and uh, yeah as the others have said thank you for the amazing quotes I, I think some of them are really powerful and I'll definitely look into them and you. from your work I noticed a lot of references from different cultures a lot of examples from uh, Japan for example the temporary wood architecture or how they have dense suburbs as opposed to uh, sparse yeah. suburbs in the West or yeah. uh, in Europe, you have long lasting architecture with a huge emphasis on preservation and also this indigenous Australian sense of uh, mm. the hyper object versus, I don't know how to call it, like the Western selfish view of the world. And yeah. I was wondering, so, so you have these opposites present at the same time across the mm. whole globe. So mm. essentially what we're trying to do is change Western culture into something else. And <laughs> in a nutshell, I'm, I'm wondering how can you even do that? And uh, <laughs> also, because people like what they're familiar with, for example, me, a, a European, I really like those uh, 
uh, cobblestone stone streets and narrow uh, alleys. But maybe that's not appealing to someone who grew up in a suburb driving around with uh, a car. And yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm just wondering, how can you change this embedded culture? Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, it's a, again, a massive question and a great question, Gabor. And I think you clearly read some of my writing as well, because it's, um, I really like this, uh, this Japanese sensibility on, on a kind of a, a dynamism and a sense of change. And they have, you know, very slow change and then quite quick change running at the same time. So those temples go back a thousand years and yet they're destroyed every 25 years and rebuilt. You know, so you have these two clock speeds running simultaneously. And so the long-term tradition and then the short-term change enable kind of dynamism there. And you see the same thing in the cities, you know, the average lifespan of a building in Tokyo is about 28 years. Um, at the same time, there's a Shinto temple, which goes back, you know, you know thousands at least. I think in the, in the in the European cities, which, you know, I grew up in, um, we have a tendency, partly because we built them out of stone, to preserve things and keep them static. And that was unfortunate, I think, when that comes to things like streets, which is what I really care about. You know, the streets are where cities happen. And the work I was doing in Sweden was to try and say that we've accidentally preserved the culture of the 1980s just by making it in concrete or the 1950s or the 1940s. You know, it sort of sticks around too long. And now those cobbled streets, which, of course, we also have in Stockholm. I mean, you try and ride an e-scooter on one of those cobbled streets, it's, it's kind of impossible. It's not very pleasant on a bike. You know, we've had a bike for 150 years. So, so I think there's kind of a, there's a rationale behind those things. But then you also need to enable this sense of change. And it doesn't mean to change everything. Just again, if you look at Tokyo, there's old stuff and new stuff. But I, I do worry that we tend to hang on to stuff in the West a little bit, assuming that it stands for some kind of tradition. Um, so I'm, I'm much more interested in asking the question, okay, what ought to move quickly and what ought to move slowly? Or what would be a benefit to having this kind of clock speed for this technology? And the technology can be a building or a street or a bit of code. And um, what's a slow technology that's also interesting? And that is, you know, Western culture also has that in there as well, obviously. Um, and when I live in Melbourne right now. So like there's a place which goes back 60,000 years and yet at the same time has multiple histories simultaneously over the last 200 years so it's not like we're going to go back to what it was before the english turned up and colonized the place invaded the place it's now about moving forward so how do we pull all of those histories together what can we draw from from multiple cultures working together in that very diverse you know kaleidoscope of ideas so the, the critique would be i guess just to close this answer um, what, what I'm saying is tech doesn't belong to Silicon Valley, would be one other way of thinking about that. Uh, or Shanghai, for that matter. But it's like, it, it is a diverse thing being produced with by diverse peoples all over the world for millennia. And how we take that forward in cities, given that they're diverse places, means that you have to then move forward from that position. And I don't mean that Silicon Valley shouldn't exist, by the way. You know, I just mean that take and use and deploy and adapt, but also look at multiple other traditions of technology. That might be much more interesting. So it's not really West versus East or North, but this South, I'm just saying, all of this stuff is good. Let's figure it out on the ground, whether it's Taipei or Melbourne, they'll figure out a different response. Uh, Gustavo, these are such good questions. Uh, how the hell am I supposed to answer them at 11.30 at night, but keep going. <laughs> Thank Gustavo. you. Man. Um, yeah. Well, uh, I am from Ecuador. Uh, I am an architect and a data scientist. And currently, I'm working on on a startup that is working through nine countries in Latin America. So, thank you very much for your presentation. It was amazing. My question is thank adding you. a bit to Gabor's uh, question. Uh, from your experience so far, where do you see the most challenges in applying these kind of changes or digital proposals? Do you think is a thing economic? I think you think that people don't want to change. Do you think that municipalities uh, don't want to implement this kind of projects? Where do you see the the, hmm. the bottleneck in yeah. these kind of projects? Um, I think sometimes it's also our perception about those things. I, I think people are quite happy with change. Actually, I don't. I know people say, "Oh, people don't like change." I think it massively depends. 
<laughs> if they're doing the change, then it's fine, you know? And I, I think about something like food culture, you know, that changes so rapidly. If I think about Britain, unlike Ecuador, I, Britain had a terrible food culture when I was growing up. You know, the food was appalling. <laughs> and then, uh, exactly. But like in the last 15, 20 years, a complete reversal you know like people are now cooking thai food at home and you know trying to make sushi at the weekends it's just like a it's a radical shift in a sense so and that's about food which is highly intimate and personal and cultural and complex and all of those things and economic right so i think it depends on the kind of change i think people are kind of up for change if they're part of the change i think municipalities can be a problem massively um it depends, though. You know, some of my best work has been with amazing municipality partners who have completely changed the way I think. Uh, but then I also know that, you know, a transport planner trained in the 1980s and still using those models is super problematic. You know, it's just that's, that's a, that can be a real problem. But again, they're assuming a, a set of things. I think I'm not sure that people are stuck too much on technologies, for instance, like in Australia, I think, you know, most people drive to work, right? So I'm just thinking, how the hell do I get from cycling and things like that? Um, I think actually people like convenience. So if you make it convenient to drive the car, then of course they're going to. If you made it super convenient, like Copenhagen and Amsterdam had to ride a bike, you have 50% of the population riding a bike to work, not a problem. So it's not the technology and it's not the attitude. It's, it's more that we have made it difficult for them to do other things. And that's what, I, that's what I'm interested in doing. Certainly don't think it's financial either, by the way. I think there's more than enough money kicking around. Some places there aren't, but that's, a re, that's just a redistribution of wealth issue. There is so much wealth in the world we can, one could deploy here. Um, so yeah, I mean, each case is also super specific, obviously. I don't want to generalize too much about that question. But I, I, I don't see... Um, I'm not. I'm an optimist, maybe probably problematically as a designer, but I, I don't see any structural, material barriers to the kind of changes we need to make. I think they're largely attitudinal and sometimes on our part as much as anybody else. Thank you very um, much. So, uh, yeah. Let's fix it. <laughs> yeah. uh, is that die die next? I'm not sure. I had to, uh, D. D. Uh, Hi, Dan. This is super, super amazing. Uh, I really love uh, like the others, your videos and also the play of words. I think that the quotes are really powerful. I have a background in anthropology, uh, historic preservation, art history, and I'm based in New York City working in community development. Uh, so I'm really excited right. to see the participatory aspects of it. And I really uh, quote you that had the artist as said, like design the beginnings, not endings really stood out to me. And I just wonder if you could talk more about it, if you have any specific strategies, uh, examples, or how if you have gone back to the past examples to see how these uh, kind of cases evolved, like, did you see that yeah. you designed? Did it like take other forms? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um... So there was Brian Eno, who's a, you know, in his in his world, a really famous um, musician and artist. That he and he's talked a lot about gardening, and I think gardening, by the way, is one of the best metaphors for technology we could find. That and cooking, as you can probably tell, because uh, they're both about they're very engaged. We can talk about recipes, ingredients. It's highly cultural. It requires you to stay on board. You know, you can have a plan for a garden, but anybody who's done any gardening knows that uh, the plan goes up in smoke the first time the weather changes so you have to get out there and adapt it as you're going constantly learning from it so i think that what brian was partly getting at that focus on the beginning get something going but then stay on board and keep tending the soil and keep weeding in a gardening terminology and you can still have these outcomes right you can still have an outcome in mind the mistake we make usually with things like urban planning for instance is that we say, okay, here's this district and here's what it's going to look like in 2040 and here's exactly how much that's going to cost and this is literally how much concrete we're going to need to make this happen. And we, we actually lock down all of the actions and interventions and that's the bit I'd say we don't know. You want to keep that stuff fluid, right, but keep the outcomes clear. So let's say we want, you know, kids to be playing in the streets we want clean air and clean water we want it to be super green and biodiverse we could even put metrics against those if you want to the outcomes but don't promise the actual interventions certainly the further away you get into the future 
you want to obviously be agile about that and take a, an advantage of technologies as they arise and test them out and pivot and adapt and weave your way through it again more like a gardener that's constantly adapting based on all kinds of variables so get something going and design a great beginning and if people don't do that it's not very interesting you won't get their motivation hold the outcomes there but then you know anybody asks you to do a roadmap just ignore them it's just for a start it's the wrong metaphor it's got road in the name but secondly it's just useless it's just, you know you can't predict that stuff just stay engaged and stay on it so with the swedish stuff that's somehow what we managed to do we convinced the government where i was working to say we're not going to do the traditional urban planning process here we're just going to start some experiments in the street and we don't know what's going to happen <laughs> So we can assume that the street's going to get greener and more convivial and the air will be cleaner. You know, those things are probably true because we're putting trees in there and getting people involved, right? It's pretty obvious. But we're not going to promise anything about these outcomes until we've actually started something. And so that's how that happened. And that's now got like five or six cities working across Sweden. Um, you know, bit by bit, parking space by parking space, you know, kind of reclaiming those streets back with the communities on board and the kit, the, the, the actual, you know, the wood bits and all of that stuff that changes from city to city and it'll evolve over time. So that's the thing, hold the outcomes, get something going, but don't promise that you can design the entire A to Z, you know, like in advance. Um, unfortunately, that's what policy making rather than planning kind of somehow pretends that you think you can do that but we just have to resist that and find a different way a different mode of practice i think thank you so much so, yeah no, thank you um maxime hi dan thanks a lot for the presentation um i'm max Pleasure. so I'm, I'm based in the netherlands i'm myself also a strategic designer so i really do relate a lot with uh, with your work and actually, it's, right. there's some interesting things you're telling in, uh, in Trojan Horses and, and Dark Matter, your, your book, mm -hmm. where basically there's kind of the, this within, without, uh, like inside or outside kind of um, yeah. consultancy or advice you can give to a government, for instance. So the question is really like this private-public relationship. So, for mm -hmm. instance, if you have big missions that what you're defining with, uh, with Mariana Mazzucato, it's like mm -hmm. if you have those big missions that are mostly like civic minded or at least uh, um, with, with like new public values that aims to mm. be good for everyone. Then the question is based on your experience, both in the private and public sector, how is that possible to be achieved while having drivers that are completely different in the public sector and the private sector where one needs to pay himself by having some kind of revenue in a way and the other one not. Massive question oh, man. for that time. I know exactly. <laughs> Can one of you just ask what was the typeface on slide seven? <laughs> um, but no, this, so this one is, uh, I think, you know, there's a difference between doing this in Sweden, of course, perhaps, um, where you might argue, uh, I don't really want to say this actually, because I don't, I don't think it's as simple as, oh, Swedish private sector companies are all on board with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. I don't think that's true any more than it is in France or Singapore. Um, I think increasingly, however, uh, private sector companies are understanding that their role goes beyond just maximizing shareholder value. I think that is um, understood. And there's, you know, there's kind of this slow change in some cases, but that change is happening. And very rapid in some areas. So this kind of stakeholder capitalism, some others have called it. That's not what Mariana Mansukato calls it, but it's, you know, there are many, many movements in that direction for obvious reasons. And so I think we, we shouldn't ignore that. And then we can see also society increasingly, I think, um, being clearer about this as well. So you know, in Australia, the climate skeptics are dying year by year or disappearing. <laughs> We have the school strikes happening at scale. You know, uh, you have populations beginning to change their perception. And it's not to say that it's like that. Of course, there are many climate skeptics still here in Australia, even when you have bushfires and floods. But it's it's clear for me anyway that the movement is in one direction now at least. And then it's a case of how quick and how big and how you know when can, when can we get there. So all I was trying to do with those missions is say let's create a space where we can pull public and private and third sector together kind of in the room and it was sometimes literally in the room and just we put on the table these shared 
challenges, shared infrastructures, actually. Not a shared challenge, because something like carbon is too big climate, but we said street or school food or something like this. And school food, you recognize there are farmers trying to make a buck, there are logistics companies, there is the public sector procuring, they're all in the same system. And you make that very clear. It's fine for people to make profits, of course. I have no problem with this at all. Um, public sector also has value generation going on. So but by bringing it all into the same table in the room at the same time, you can kind of see this is a shared challenge, a shared environment. The value is moving around here. If we get this right, all boats rise on that tide, essentially. And yes, there are different values at play there, but um, we, we found anyway that that approach was not like a magic wand. It took, it took work and persuasion and conversation, but we found actually it was, I can't think of a company that we went to that didn't respond well to that. So, you know, Volvo, for instance, Volvo Cars were saying, you know, essentially they see the future of cities with fewer cars in it, right? It's just for them, that's kind of the obvious trajectory. The 20th century was filling up cars, like the 1900s, filling up cities with cars. But from now on, it's more likely to be mobility as a service, car sharing, things like that. And that's what they're getting behind now. So they'll still make money from that. But it's a very different business to the one of 1950 or 1990. So I think we're just trying to create the space for that shared conversation. And then you see that it's very hard for people to stay in their corner and sort of not engage with that shared idea. And something like the street or a school food system, you can say, well, this bit's private, this is public, this is third sector, this is in between, this is public to private, private to public. And you can start sketching that thing out. And you become aware, a bit like we heard with the air conditioning earlier, all of that is connected. Um, so again, I don't mean to make this sound like it was easy because not everything worked or they did at all, some super hard, but that's I think what the work is about, recognizing those boundaries that we've put between things that are somewhat artificial and they're all interconnected. How do we create a project or a program or a prototype that enables us to work through that together? Um, that's the only answer I have. I don't think there's anything more. <laughs> erudite from this time of no that's great thanks it's it's cultural creation yeah. yes of course thank you exactly exactly and maybe the, maybe well, thank you maxim for making me think maybe the thing then to respond to say uh culture curation or creation through tangible projects mm -hmm. so like the thing about using i would say this is a designer but one thing design can do is create a physical or a digital or an environment a space that makes otherwise abstract questions very, very tangible. And that creates a culture. Um, as soon as you make the thing in the street, we all have to go there and all turn up and we all love it. You know, it's like we're all very proud that we made that happen. That creates a binded culture, a partnership actually, which is actually much more important than the thing in the street. <laughs> but we couldn't have got to that partnership if it wasn't for like making something together. So. Um, that's a mistake that policymakers often make. They dwell in an abstract world without. I mean, I literally took people from the National Transport Agency to the street, and they said, "This is the first time in thirty years of work I've actually been to a project in the street." You know, I've, I've otherwise been writing policy about. They just don't do it. So, culture creation, yes, but it's a particular culture of shared collaboration and production and values. Um, Flaminia, is that your name? Yes. I probably said that really badly, sorry. No, 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 it's perfect. Thank you very much first to, for the lecture. I think that uh, the interactive approach was very, very interesting. Um, I mean, I'm Flaminia, I'm an economist by background uh, uh, and I currently work in the real estate sector as a sustainability officer. Um, and I have been reading your article on Medium, uh, talking about uh, uh, working with Brian Eno, that is also one of my favorite mm -hmm. artists. And uh, I really, I really appreciate the fact that uh, you mentioned that uh, the point uh, about cities is culture and not efficiency, because sometimes mm -hmm. I have the impression that also our policymakers tends to perceive technology as something that make our life easier from an efficient point of view well this the 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 relationship between culture and technology is super strong it dates back to leonardo da vinci to my opinion no so and it's not really a question here it's more like a, i was more making a reflection and maybe if you could add about it so yeah yeah, yeah. what is in i think the, I know. 
how can AI bring back also cult uh, technology into culture and culture into technology and uh, and uh, also nourish the, the 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 culture itself in terms of political debates, uh, arts, uh, intellectual debates. I think that's uh, that. that could yeah, be. yeah, yeah. No, an another small question. Thank you. So it's I think the. Um... <laughs> It, it, culture is profoundly useful here because I think that ultimately that's what humans do, actually. <laughs> I think, you know, that's kind of what we're about at the end of the day. All of the other stuff is like uh, dressing for that, enabling for it. But really what we do is culture and we are culture. You know, culture has two meanings in English at least, I guess. But culture as in a way of life, you know, living together in a, you know, the culture of being in a place. and. And then there's culture as in creating art or cultural production, you know, they're, and they're obviously linked. But the reason I chose Brian um, or asked him and he was kind enough to answer was um, partly to imagine having a, you know, a bunch of transport planners controlling the street. And then I bring in an art, a famous artist and musician to write the principles for the street design. And they're like, huh? <laughs> so but that was deliberate, you know, and it was like it was actually not just using his words, which were wonderful and his thoughts, but his his the image of him as a what what he does and saying, well, that's equally valid about something like the street. Why is that not equally valid to you with your traffic calculation? You know, both of those things happen in the street. So, you know, why is one seen as scientific and rational and uh, authoritative that's and good. proper? And the artist is seen as somehow frivolous and playful and so that was that was going on there. The other thing I would say about what I've taken from um, Eno's work over the years, like many great musicians who understand technology very well, is the playfulness and the inefficiency. And he, so you know, if you think about an electric guitar or something, uh, which is you know a hundred years old, or a piano which is several hundred years old, um, they're not really efficient as such. I mean, they kind of make a noise, but then lots of things make a noise. <laughs> So, uh, and uh, you know, those six strings on an electric guitar and all of the complexity of the electric fields means that you can hack them and play with them. You know, people have jammed screwdrivers into guitars and Hendrix has smashed guitars. You can push them into amplifiers and make feedback. You can run them through synthesizers. You can play them with your hands. You can take them with your teeth. You know, they're just extraordinarily diverse in terms of how people have responded to it but it's just one hunk of wood with six strings plugged into an electric amplifier it's so basic as a technology but it's so unbelievably endlessly creative people are still finding new ways of hacking that thing 100 years later so i think it's really powerful and interesting because uh, as an approach to tech is you know it's kind of it's seamful as i said earlier you can kind of understand how it works very quickly indeed you can see the strings, you can see the pickup, it's plugged into the wall. You know, none of that, there's no hidden code there. But um, then it's endlessly complex. You know, it's immediately approachable. Again, a, a two-year-old knows how to make a noise on a piano. Um, but, and it's infinitely complex and you could spend your whole life and still not master that instrument, right? So I think there's something very powerful as tech, looking at things like music and instruments, say so we could learn a lot from them in terms of, the way those technologies have um, evolved over the years and remained creative um, whilst being legible and seamful and adaptable and hackable and being accessible and you know all of the words that we've yeah. uh, affordable actually you know <laughs> all of the things we've talked about tonight and probably Thank you for bringing that up. musical instruments are the most direct example of this uh, synergy between technology and, and culture. I think so. And as you, as you pointed out in your question, it's like, then it's not about efficiency. You know, it's like I mean, a guitar isn't the most efficient way to do anything, but it's endlessly interesting. So, Thank or you a synthesizer much. or, you know, whatever it might be. Yeah. Music in general. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So my last mispronounced name is Tabea or Tadia or Tabia. That was or very Anderson. good. All of it. <laughs> I, I take it all. <laughs> no, I, I also want to say thank you uh, for the lecture. It was really interesting. Um, uh, I'm Tabia. I'm uh, a German PhD uh, uh, living in the Netherlands. I do my research on spatial agent based modeling of uh, urban public health intervention scenarios. Um, but uh, I actually had a very, very similar question to Flamina. I just uh, want to maybe zoom in a little bit more. So 
uh, basically, I've seen um, that you you talked uh, a, lo a lot, and I've, I've heard it also uh, in in other contexts more uh, that there's um, um, experimentation about urban interfaces for mobility, for participation in the urban design process, for enhanced perception of the environment in order to support individual decision making or so. But um, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, you know, because there's um, multiple um, ideas that one can have about what the function of a city is. And I think mm -hmm. that um, one function is also uh, really to bring people together and to help us fulfill ourselves. And so basically mm -hmm. it comes back to culture, what, what I also want to say, but a specific Absolutely. aspect of false culture, which is that, you know, um, do you know about uh, yeah, uh, urban interfaces that really enhance our creative interaction and also our you know, like ability to co-create and innovate and to radically self-express uh, in, in, with each other uh, in an urban environment? And yeah, did, did you yeah. engage in experiments about that? And you mentioned the, the instruments, which is a very interesting thing, but it's, it's still usually a, a one person interacting with this one uh, interface for expression. But I'm also really interested in this collective creative experience yeah. and uh, how Absolutely. urban interface can, can support us in that. Do you have any idea? No, it's a great, no, it's a great question. I guess, I suppose, just to sound the music metaphor, of course, an electric guitar by itself is also kind of boring. So you need a drummer and a bass player and a, and a keyboard player and, you know, uh, and an audience and, you know, all of that. <laughs> and probably some beer and some electricity, you know, so it, it, is, a, it is a highly collaborative venture still often music. Um, always i think and also there's a composition and then there's the performance and they're different you know like there's, there's massively collaborative so i'm interested in those collaborative acts but to answer your question more specifically i think um again if you're taking technology in the broadest sense of the word the, the thing i showed you very quickly with the swedish streets and stuff was deliberately again this wooden hackable kind of parklet kind of adaptive thing i really I think that that is a technology and it's the thing that you can bring people around. And of course it builds social fabric. What it says is the street is for you to design if you live on the street or you use the street. Some of the school kids live on the street. Some of the school kids just walk up the street to get to the school. So all of those people, the street belongs to them. It doesn't belong to the traffic planner who's sitting in the town hall, you know, sort of some kilometers away. It belongs to the people on the street. So then that, can you create an environment where they are collaborating and playing that out together? And that's where it becomes more like this performative, interactive, responsive social fabric, which I, I completely agree with. I think the whole point of cities is, you know, people coming together. I would say the, the, the really the subtle distinction there actually with cities be what Richard Senna says is that cities are places where you live with people that are not like you. <laughs> So that's the thing about cities, and it's the diversity of it, where I bump into someone like you who's German, or I bump into Maxime, you know, like, it, it's, um, that's what's interesting. That also makes it different to a village, for instance. A village also could have a kind of a, a village square that, that probably may be like four or five families that have lived there for hundreds of years. So it's, they're all a bit like each other. I don't, mean in a, I don't mean in a nasty way. I just mean it's a function of diversity and numbers. So a good city is not just about bringing people together, it's about bringing different people together. And that's again, makes this genuine collaboration and real creativity emerges from that mix, which is what the great cities have always done. And, you know, less great cities end up being too homogenous, but it's, um, so I think you could also use digital layers to do that, by the way, my friend, my, you know, my silly anecdote about living next to Hubert and having the solar cells and the batteries and us falling out that if you thought about that, so how would you design an energy system at a super local scale that lift, that used social fabric as the way that you decide how the energy moves around or is stored or used or put back into the grid and what price it goes back in or whatever it might be. That you could design in a way which accentuates the social fabric and uses kind of collaboration to get there. And it could do with digital or analog interfaces or a combination of both best case. Or you could design that system to be completely invisible, effectively algorithmic. And let's just say worst case scenario, algorithms that no one explains. So it's opaque algorithms somewhere else that you have no control over. That's how blocks are also being designed right now. And I'd argue, okay, that's problematic because then it's not bringing people together around the system in question. 
there's no way I can collaborate with it. I can't rewrite the code okay, if I can't understand it. Um, so, you know, these are just the choices we make as designers or coders or whatever. Just can we can we design systems which take what you said, cities are about culture and diversity and bringing people together and use those to play out around things like infrastructures and urban technologies. And the, the way that that infrastructure is heading now towards these more decentralized distributed systems like energy can work at that scale. You couldn't do that in 1950 or 1980. Right? You had to have a big coal fired power station somewhere else. There was no way I could interact with that thing really, except turning my lights on and off. But um, these technologies can be super local, highly participative, therefore very diverse, um, very interactive, shared, co owned, you know, like that's really powerful and interesting, I think, um, depending on how we do it. So, yeah. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you so much for taking the time. Pleasure. And I, no I also totally agree that uh, it's so interesting how, uh, you know, the power structures of a system that we would not, uh, in theory, understand as a cultural system has an influence on the social fabric, as you say, and hence a secondary exactly. influence, uh, in influence on, on culture and creation and empowerment. And exactly, exactly. And that's why we can't just let te technologies be this sort of technical things that are just done by engineers for the sake of argument. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like an electric guitar again, is a technical thing but clearly it's also artistic and cultural and beautiful and sculptural it also has engineering in it at the same time you know it's all of that in one okay Thanks. and Tigoni, you you managed to sneak in there oh and then Nikhil is like, so oh, you I'm have another <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to go to bed people <laughs> I will be very, right. very, very brief. I just want to uh, just thank you again, like for this discussion. It was like really thought provocative and like questions making for me. It's what I do, and I just wanted Great. to make a comment on like your last uh, question that what kind of designs could drive the transformation. And it's just more mm -hmm. about sharing. Like for me, because I'm an architect that originally now as I work as a sustainability engineer in physics. Uh, but uh, like from my design school, uh, what I kept was that they were trying to provoke us into like design is political, like we needed to be aware that this is true. And then we yeah. had to always have a design theory that each of us, let's say, sticks to it and like have their own principles. And in that case, if all kind of the people that are trained for being designers always have yeah. this question making uh, process that you said then this leads to transformation because always you're critical or you're you're trying to stick to your ethics let's say and trying exactly. to people that don't agree with like uh, like the, this in their in like uh, yeah in their weaving environment you're proposing so yeah 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 just as a no that's great <laughs> it's a great reflection thank you and uh, come to melbourne <laughs> but it's um <laughs> I would say that, um, yeah, I'm very much one for sort of practice-based theorizing, if we're going to do theory, or like applied or prototype-led design work, because that's when you start realizing that oh, these constraints aren't just, you know, how much time I have or like how, much, how, how good my software is, but actually what the community thinks, what the politicians think, what the climate is, what the history is and the culture, you know, all of those real world things. So with, with our school here, we're trying to get it right in terms of making very much place-based prototypes pull practice into real-world context and blur the line between the city and the university as much as we can. Um, so, so yeah, thank you. It's a really nice reflection you had on design being this political act in the way I think I tried to describe as well. It's about collective decision-making, a shared decision-making about shared things, which is kind of politics. But, um, yeah, also, also like it. revising, revising every time the theory, as you said, with feedback that we're getting from the city, from yeah. actors, from stakeholders. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Thank you, Nikhil. Come on, you can be the last guy. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for bring it on. Uh, I have a, a a question about leaky abstractions. Um, so I do software stuff. So I'll use software language. Um, I. Um, you know, I, I'll take an example of a car. I don't actually really understand how a car works in any meaningful way. Like I understand there's con combustion at some point, And I understand if I press the pedal and I turn the thing, it'll go. Um, 
but there's a leaky abstraction. I could understand, but I don't necessarily need to understand to operate the thing. Mm. Mm. And so I, I, I liked your example of the guitar because it's kind of a similar thing. You know, I don't need to know the harmonics of how the waves work, but I, I can do stuff with it. There's sort of a meaningful yeah. interface through the thing. And I'm trying to understand sort of the difference between constraints and agency. Um, mm. And then sort of how does one build meaningful agency? Because in a way, what I, from what I've taken from your conversation, which I've appreciated very much, thank you, is, mm. you know, you want to, constraints kind of give freedom, but you want to give meaningful agency at the same time. And so I'm curious, mm. how, do you, how do you balance that? And how does one sort of design systems, you know, and I understand also from, we're going to answer my own question a little bit. I think it's a little bit about sort of, like you said, building flexibility and, you know, adaptability in the kind of system, but I'm yeah. curious yeah. if you can riff on that a little bit. I think also, yeah, I mean, adaptability, uh, adaptive design, when I discovered that, um, really a guy called Tom Moran at IBM, who I saw give a talk in, um, a, an ACM conference back in oh, a long time ago, 1994. But he was drawing on Stuart Brand's work, How Buildings Learn, which was borrowed from a guy called Frank Duffy, um, looking at the way that buildings change over time and what you can adapt and what you can't adapt. And, you know, some people can make a building and I can't, but I can, you know, rearrange the furniture, you know. So you're aware of those different systems moving and some are more legible, as you said. Um, I think the key thing about, along with that, designing adaptation on purpose, um, the car metaphor was quite nice. I reckon my dad, when he was alive, you know, he, he could have taken apart a car from that he grew up with, like in the 30s, 40s, 50s, but um, 100 years ago almost, but let's say 70 years ago. But then about 1980, 1990, like there's no way he could understand a car anymore. It became a computer essentially. Now it's hundreds of computers. You know? So um, the, ch the thing I'd say though is then there's this responsibility and so you can get into a car i guess and start driving it um just like you can pick up an electric guitar and start making a noise but then you're responsible also as an actor within that system and you kind of are in control of most of the levers about your responsibility as in if you drive too fast that's on you right and if i make too much noise with my guitar and the neighbors get pissed off that's like, that's on me as well you know so i have to i have to balance that and i'm responsible for it and i'm an actor in that system but I think actually about was this Dutch traffic engineer called Hans Mondermann, who in the 60s started redesigning the way that Dutch um, intersections worked by taking away almost every bit of traffic engineering he could. So he removed traffic lights from streets. And there's now 40, 50 years of data showing that that's the safest way to make a road work is actually to take away traffic lights and barriers, right? Because people slow down and they look each other in the eye and no one really wants to crash into each other. Like, why would you do that? <laughs> so the system, if it's, you know, there are other things going on there around the way that streets are designed, you know, but um, which keeps a kind of a steady, slowish, but still meaningful speed. But it relies on then all of the actors having a shared responsibility in the system for the overall system and themselves within it. And they can control most of those moving pieces. So if everybody here was driving through this intersection, we'd all be just like, are you going first, am I? And then, you know, like nudging our way through it together. That's the safest way to do it. If you put traffic lights in, you start getting accidents because people have, we've then outsourced the decision-making to some other system, which isn't under our control, actually. We're responding to it. And we don't really know the algorithm around the traffic light. So imagine then extrapolating that if you use AI carelessly in an urban environment where most decisions are being made by something else somewhere else and you don't have agency and your responsibility starts going out the window. That's when people start driving too fast on streets and trying to cut through traffic lights actually and creates accidents. So that's what I'm trying to guard against. So yes, there's kind of, um, there's an accessibility to those systems, a seamfulness, a legibility, as you say, the guitar and the car, they're great examples. How do we retain that? But then when I'm not assuming that everybody's gonna write code, I'm just saying that um, I also understand what the system is doing and um, who's in charge of it actually, um, what their motives or values might be and how I can have some influence on that. And that, you know, that's how we, we sort of made cities work. You know, the reason that planning committees exist and have you know, really boring meetings full of lots of paperwork 
means that nonetheless, you can go back and look through every single planning meeting for the last 100 years and see the decisions taken and so on. You can understand them, or should you wish to go and look at it. Um, my friend Anthony Townsend you know, pointed this out a few years ago. As soon as we start making those decisions using algorithms instead, how does that work? You know, what's the legibility of the decision in that case? Who, who, who made those decisions as effectively as the software engineer and a bunch of shared software engineering libraries? You know? <laughs> Then how do we read those in 40 years time? You know, it's just a uh, massively problematic. So, so again, yes, let's use tech. I mean, you know, as I said, like that, even Hans Mondermann's work was using tech in a sense. Um, but I think you put it very nicely, this kind of legibility, adaptability, so the ability for systems to learn, and then agency is an individual within a broader system, and then shared responsibility for that overall system adds up and how that comes together. That's the city bit, you know, the bigger than the sum of the parts, so all of my actions add up with yours and everybody else's. And if we took those principles, perhaps, one of you should write an article about that if you think it's interesting, I can't be worried. But if you took those principles, that would be really maybe a good starting point there. And um, yeah, thank you. Nikki, you've got me thinking about that one. <laughs> yeah, thanks for, thanks for, uh, making my question better than it was. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. Well, thanks so much. Can, can, can yeah, I go now? Obviously, yes. <laughs> really. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thanks a lot, Dan, for taking the time to answer all the questions. It's it's been night in Melbourne, so really, thanks a lot for this. But no, it's, it's, it's now Thursday in Melbourne. It's just a, it's like five minutes into the next day. So I'll tell you what happens with Thursday if you like. But anyway. Uh, no, thank you. I mean, great questions and um, pleasure to speak to you all. Thanks for organizing me there. I'm happy to, as I said, like send links or follow-ups or keep in touch. Just let me know. Thanks a lot.